So good morning, everybody. I think it's still morning. <laughs> we are going to get started. Um, first of all, thank you all so much for coming today. Um, this is really kind of a nasty day looking at the weather, and, but we appreciate you being out here. We are here today to hear remarks from Mayor Steve Shule and Chief C.J. Davis about recent violence taking place in Durham. Um, following their remarks, you will have a chance to ask questions, and we ask the mayor to repeat your questions so that we can record it. And uh, with that, I will turn it over to the mayor. Also, if you would silence your phones to make sure they don't go off during the remarks, we'd appreciate it. Okay, I'll turn it over to Mayor Shule. Thank you, Thank you very much, Beverly. It's good to see everybody out. Thank you for coming out on this wet day to talk about this very important topic. Uh, we're really glad that you all are here uh, to carry this message to our community. I have some remarks and then I'll be followed by Chief Davis with some remarks and then we're happy to take any questions that you might have. Uh, this past week we had another homicide and again it was a teenager who lost his life not far from here and this time in a drive-by shooting. This is a terrible event, a tragic event, and my heart goes out to the family and friends of this young person. I have two sons myself and I can only imagine what this feels like for his family. This loss of life, this gun violence, and all gun violence is absolutely unacceptable in Durham. I know that our residents want to know what we are doing to fight back against gun violence, and I want to talk about that today along with Chief Davis. I also want you to know that Chief Davis and the police force she leads have my total and absolute confidence. Chief Davis is a remarkable leader, and she is deploying all of the policing tools at our command to stop this violence. Every time there is a gunshot wound here in the Bull City, it doesn't just tear into the body of the wounded, it tears into their family, into their neighborhood, and into our entire community. We are one community, one body, and the loss of life, the loss of a life, especially a, a young life, is a tragedy for all of us. We are not separate, we are not insulated, every child is a child of Durham, and we must do everything in our power to assure that we never lose another one. We have had a very tough few months of gun violence in Durham, you know that. And in this regard, we're part of a national trend. While some categories of crime are down during the pandemic, nationally we have seen a large increase in gun violence and shootings and homicides, and there is no doubt that the pandemic is playing a role in this. The coronavirus has caused isolation and economic dislocation on a mass scale. And the worst effects have fallen on our economically disadvantaged communities and communities of color. The virus has heightened the factors that lead to gun violence, unemployment, housing instability, hunger, mental health, and mental health problems, and isolation. Instead of being educated in a school building, our teenagers are at home, often with their parents at work, and sometimes out on the streets and under the influence of the streets. Durham Parks and Rec normally operates many on-site programs for thousands of children and teenagers, which are impossible during COVID to operate at that scale. These are pandemic realities in Durham and across the nation. In addition, across the nation, gun sales have surged in recent months. There are now 393 million guns in America far more than the number of people in who live in our country. As long as guns are available in these quantities, and as long as they are easily available to almost anyone who wants a gun, we are not going to be able to end gun violence in this country. And that is a hard truth which everybody needs to hear. So we know that in regard to gun violence, Durham is suffering much like the rest of the country. But we also know that despite the factors that exist across our nation, the pandemic, out of control gun sales, drugs and gangs, these exist across the nation. We in Durham have to do everything we can on a local level to fight gun violence here at home. It begins with smart strategic policing and under the leadership of Chief Davis, we have that. Let me describe some of that work. It begins by hiring the best, 
training them well and leading them well. I have often ridden with young Durham police officers on Saturday night, and I did so most recently just before the pandemic hit. What I can tell you is that we have an outstanding police force from top to bottom. Durham's training is the envy of the state, far more rigorous than state requirements. I am so proud of the young recruits who graduate from each of our recruiting classes, and I have seen their work close up many times. Regularly, Chief Davis and her top deputies sit at the head of a table in what is called crime abatement. I have attended this, and let me tell you what it is like. In that room, each district captain and other officers from the district come to the front of the room, describe to the commanding officers in specific detail the crimes that have been committed in the district during the past week. The trends they see, the suspects they have identified, the arrests they have made, and the challenges they face. This is all backed up by statistics and maps projected behind each captain showing each violent incident, revealing trends and clusters. And then the questions start from the top deputies along with suggestions and connections are made from district to district by other officers in the room. It is an impressive use of information and expertise and it works to inform strategy and tactics and to support our patrol officers in the field. Now, with the support of the City Council, the Department is adding another information tool to help our officers on patrol in real time. This is called Street Smart, and it directs real-time data about criminal activity to our officers in the field. Currently, our patrol officers may have information from intel meetings that is a week old. This can cause the loss of crucial investigative days, or they can arrive on a crime scene without critical situational information. Street Smart is designed to provide situational awareness directly to officers on the scene, rather than having to hear verbally from commanders or from meeting notes. We believe this will be an important new tool for our officers. All of this work is in the service of an overriding strategy that is shared not only by Chief Davis, but by Sheriff Burkett and his department as well. And this strategy is based on the knowledge that an overwhelming majority of the gun violence in Durham is driven by a relatively few very violent individuals. People who are willing to shoot, to hurt, or kill others, and who do so repeatedly, often inviting retaliation. The strategy of our police department and our sheriff's department is do everything we can to identify these people who are repeatedly committing violent crimes, to arrest them, and to get them off the streets. To further that aim, our police department has made a recent significant change in its investigative practices. Chief Davis and her team have now centralized the investigation of incidences of gun violence into a single focused investigative unit. This investigation has historically been done on a district by district basis, but now this work is centralized. In 2019, a similar robbery task force was established which had a significant effect in reducing our robberies in Durham. The department is using that same approach now with gun violence investigations. The department is also closely monitoring social media to detect gang activity, including retaliation. Gangs are using social media just like the rest of us are, and monitoring that activity is a critical way to reduce gun violence in Durham. The department is increasing the visibility of police patrols in areas where we are experiencing an increase in gun violence. When a violent hotspot arises, you will see more police patrols there on a regular basis. The department is closely cooperating with the sheriff's department as well on gun violence cases. The chief and the sheriff are strong partners in close communication, and that communication echoes down the department ranks. We have had several important arrests this year which have involved police and sheriff department cooperation and cooperation with regional anti-gang task forces as well. Once these arrests are made of people committing gun violence, it is important that they be held in jail until their trial. To that end, our police department is working with the district attorney's office to make sure that the cases against these violent offenders are solid and that the district attorney has the evidence she needs to try and convict them, to try and convict them, and that the magistrates have the understanding that these repeat violent offenders need to have a bond set that will keep them off the streets. I commend the DA's office for their recent stance on keeping the accused murderer of Zion person in jail without a bail, a man with a very violent history. 
And while I'm at it, I, I do want to commend uh, Virginia Bridges on an absolutely great, super informative story on that that I think tells a really powerful, powerful story to all of us. I will tell you that the cash bail system is a terrible impediment to keeping violent offenders in jail until their trials. And later in my mark, remarks, I'm going to address that. In addition to focusing on taking the most violent offenders off the streets, the police department is working hard to meet the requirement, the requests of neighborhoods and communities and community partners. Recently, the top leadership of North Carolina Central University came to the city council with requests for help. Our interim city manager, Wanda Page, Chief Davis and their staffs met right away with the NCCU staff and we were acting on these meetings. The top request by NCCU was an extension of the territory around their campus which could be patrolled by their own campus police department. They asked to be given the same extraterritorial jurisdiction that for those patrols as Duke University has. In fact, as our staff discovered, an agreement for this jurisdiction was made between the city and NCCU way back in 2004, and within the next month, this extraterritorial jurisdiction agreement will be updated and confirmed. NCCU police officers will be able to patrol the area around their campus, just as Duke University officers do. At the same time, Chief Davis and the NCCU police chief have met and have agreed on more patrols around their campus as well. The NCCU administration has also requested measures on the streets around their campus to slow down traffic and cut down the likelihood of speeding, dri a speeding drive-by shooter. The major roads around NCCU are state-owned roads, Austin Avenue and Fayetteville Street, and so our staff has engaged the North Carolina Department of Transportation to work on these traffic measures. Senator Mike Woodard has been involved in that as well, and we should see good progress on this in the near future. I could go on, but you get the idea. Our police force is actively engaged every single day in finding the per perpetrators of violence and getting them off our streets, and they have my full support and the support of our community in this work. So now I want to change gears a moment, because here is what we know, and this is very important. Policing itself, even excellent policing, which we have, is not nearly enough. The police cannot do this alone. Besides policing, what else are we doing and what else do we need to do? Our one important strategy is violence interrupters. You all are aware of the county-funded violence interrupters who operate out of the health department called Bull City United. The folks in Bull City United are people who are formerly just involved, justice involved themselves, many of them, who understand gangs and drugs and the violence that they cause. Bull City United operates in two Durham neighborhoods, South Side and McDougal Terrace. I have been out walking the streets with Bull City United staff many times, and I've been to many of their events over the past few years. And I believe that the work of violence interrupters is very important, and I embrace their motto, peace is a lifestyle. Their aim is to stop gun violence, and especially retaliation, by going directly to the people who are ready to retaliate and talking to them about other ways. Very recently, the City Council heard a report from the Bull City United staff, and the Council is supportive of extending their activity to yet another Durham neighborhood. While this is traditionally a county government function, a public health function, the level of gun violence we have experienced in the past few months calls for us in city government to fund an extension of the violence interrupter program, and I fully expect that we will do so. In addition to violence interrupters, there are other ways in which our community needs to respond to keep ourselves safe from gun violence. Durham County government, not city government, is responsible for mental health services and social services and emergency mental health response. And the county has many excellent services in this regard. We need to continue to expand this kind of mobile response to mental health emergencies, to expand our mental health services in general, to, to expand our drug education and treatment services. And we need to continue in the city to expand Durham Parks and Rec services to youth. We need our private employers to step up to hire our youth through our summer youth internship program. When people want to know what they can do in business to keep our community safe, you can hire a young person next summer to work as an intern through our, through our Youth Works internship program. And now I want to turn to the subject of our state legislature. I have said this to the members of the press many times before, and I will say it again. What our legislature does 
is key to our ability to fight violent crime here in Durham. I hope you will take this seriously as you report about gun violence. Reporting about gun violence means reporting on what the legislature is doing or failing to do. Our legislature has slashed funding for mental health services over the past decade, as well as for drug treatment, and that causes violent crime. Our legislature has refused to expand Medicaid, despite the governor's repeated request that they do so. This failure has put many families into poverty as they seek to pay for critically necessary medical treatment. It has put mental health services out of reach of many, and that has increased violent crime. Our legislature must end, <clears throat> excuse me, must end the system of cash bail if they are serious about fighting violent crime. Cash bail fails us in two ways. First, for low-level offenders, cash bail means that we are keeping people in jail for minor offenses who absolutely should not be there. Second, and just as important, cash bail means that violent offenders who can make bail are back out on the streets as soon as they bail out. Even when a magistrate sets a high bail for someone who the police arrest for shooting someone else, that person is often bailed out by cronies they are involved with in drug deals. We see that a lot. High bails don't mean much when large amounts of drug money are involved. If we end the cash bail system, we can assess the danger that each person arrested poses to our community. We can let people remain in the community who are arrested for small offenses, and we need to do that, rather than keeping them in jail. And we can hold the truly violent individuals who are a true risk to our community. We need our legislature to end the cash bail system, to defy the bail bondsmen who are lobbying to prop it up, and to do so in this coming legislative session. And our legislature needs to en enact meaningful, common sense gun legislation. This includes passing the red flag legislation introduced by our Durham's representative, Marsha Mori, which would keep guns out of the hands of people who should not have them. This would allow law enforcement and family members to petition a court for a civil order to temporarily remove firearms from and prevent the purchase of additional firearms by individuals who are at risk of harming themselves or others. They do this now in 19 states, and we need it in North Carolina to prevent gun violence. We need background checks on every single gun sale so that guns are not falling into the hands of mentally unstable people or convicted violent felons. We need to end state preemption of local gun safety laws. Right now, we in Durham are not allowed to ban guns from our parks or trails. We're required to allow them in restaurants and bars. Guns and bars don't mix. We've got to have the local authority to end these practices to keep our community safe. We need that from our legislature if Durham is to most effectively fight gun violence. So there are four ways in which we must fight gun violence in Durham. One is smart, effective policing, and I believe very deeply that we have that. Second is providing other community resources, violence interrupters, youth programming, after school and during the summers, mental health services, drug treatment and education, non-police mobile responses to crises that will keep our community safe. Third is legislative action, especially on cash bail and common sense gun laws. And fourth is attacking the root causes of violence. If a person has a good job at a good wage, affordable health care, a good school for their child to go to and a safe, warm, affordable home where they can lay their head every night, they're not going to be committing gun violence. They're they are not going to be dealing drugs or joining gangs or shooting anyone. We have got to attack the root causes of violence. Some of that work is the work of city government, like our affordable housing work, which is taking off now across our city even before our affordable housing bond kicks in. Supporting our schools and health care system is the work of state, federal, and county government, and of our entire community. But we've got to attack root causes or we won't end gun violence in our city or our society. I will end these remarks with a comment about just one way in which the city is attacking root causes, work in which we have had remarkable results, and that is the work of the DEER program, the Durham Expunction and Restoration Program. DEER was born out of the work of the City of Durham's innovation team. The city invested $250,000 to create the DEER program to provide free help for expunctions and driver's license restoration. Prior to DEER, there were over 11,000 people in Durham, mainly our black and Latino neighbors, with a suspended driver's license due to unpaid traffic tickets that are, on the average, 16 years old. 
11,000 people in Durham with suspended driver's license due to unpaid traffic tickets that are on average 16 years old. This is not and cannot be justice. Deer attacked this problem, and as a result, over 50,000 old traffic charges dating back to the 1980s, but still leading to driver's license suspensions have been dismissed. 50,000 charges dismissed for 35,000 people. And, the city, and city staff has now worked with our judges and DA to waive $2.7 million in traffic fines and fees for 11,000 of our residents. This is transformative for the lives of these residents. People with licenses means people who can drive to work, who can get a job they couldn't get before, who can improve their lives and don't need gangs and drugs and guns to do it. In addition, last year, Deer helped 900 Durham residents get their records expunged for free. People living for years with charges on their records so they could have a chance to go back to work. This is just one example of how we attack root causes, and there are many, many others. But we need to do all of these things to prevent gun violence. None of them will do it alone. Superb, effective policing. Other community interventions like violence interruption, mental health services, and drug treatment. State legislative reforms on cash bail and sensible gun laws and attacking root causes. We have to do all of those things to fight gun violence. And if we do them well, we can make a real difference in gun violence in Durham, and I am determined that we will do that. So thank you so much, and now I'm going to introduce our wonderful chief, uh, Chief C.J. Davis, for her remarks, and then we will uh, take your questions. Good morning. Thank you, Mayor Shule. Mayor Shule has covered much of what I have prepared to say, so I will not be redundant, but I will take this opportunity to first thank you all for being here and thank my staff here at the Durham Police Department for the work that they do every day to try to curtail some of the increased violence that we've seen this year. In recent months, the Durham Police Department has responded to an unusual increase in gun-related crimes where community members have been directly or indirectly impacted. We absolutely empathize with our community members, for those individuals who on a day-to-day -day basis have to avoid the devastating effects of gun violence. However, what I would like to do right now is to take a moment to just highlight the collective work that the Durham Police Department and the community um, has taken together as we fight uh, to end the senseless violence in our city. The Durham Police Department has centralized um, our Violent Crimes Task Force. The mayor mentioned that earlier. And this has been a very, very um, successful initiative for the department as we have moved to have investigators to work closer together as opposed to being assigned out in various districts. They are working closer together to connect the various crimes that are being committed in the city and also connect the individuals um, who, are, who are participating in these incidents. Our Violent Crimes Task Force has increased their information sharing, not just with uh, those individuals inside the department, but with our community, our state, and our federal partners as well. Our investigators have been able to file charges for weapons-related offenses in, two recent, in 10 excuse me, recent shooting cases. Four of these shooting cases were cleared by arrest, and the incidents were committed by two separate juveniles in these most recent um, incidents. It cannot go unnoticed as well that the majority of these offenders are juveniles that we have uh, spoken about, not just today, but in recent months. Often, uh, we have victims who are uncooperative as well, which prohibits the file uh, the filing uh, of, of the most serious uh, charges in relation to these particular offenses. Our homicide unit has also charged and cleared by arrest nine of their cases that involve gunfire. And they have one case with charges pending currently as well. I want to also take a minute and highlight the work of our local leaders. Our ministers and clergy in our city have recently taken upon themselves to 
coordinate, collaborate, and galvanize our community members to speak up and to work with the police department in identifying individuals that are committing crimes in their community, specifically shootings. As the mayor has al already mentioned, many of the shootings that occur in the city are being committed by a small number of individuals. The department is being more laser focused in identifying those individuals and as I've said, have made significant arrests. I think one of the prevailing factors in what uh, we are talking about today remains that we can't do this by ourselves. We are just one cog in the wheel. And we are at the end of the process when it comes to the criminal justice system. There's much work to be done at the grassroots level to deal with the root causes of crime. And I know that the mayor and our council are having long deliberations about how we best address those social issues that plague our community. We would love to see the police department be put out of business, but we are very busy these days. We would love to see our citizens live in environments that aren't stricken by gunfire at night and where our young people aren't having to participate in exercises of jumping in bathtubs and ducking whenever they hear gunfire in their communities. No one should live under those circumstances. So I say thank you to our community members who have stood up, who have said enough is enough, and who are working with the Durham Police Department, who have provided information to the police department where we have been successful in identifying individuals who are committing some of these crimes. Most of the uptick that we saw this year in 2020 occurred around the months of March and April comparatively to last year. Those, that's when we saw our highest spikes in violent crime. However, over the last several uh, weeks, we have seen some of that crime sort of plateau and we've seen percentages that have decreased. So we're moving in the right direction and some of the work that we've done internally has uh, been very beneficial and we've seen some positive outcomes. But every time we see another individual, particularly a young person, a victim of a violent crime, whether they were involved in gang activity or not, that is still someone's child who has fallen uh, at the hands of gun violence. So uh, at this time, I would like to um, join the mayor in answering any questions that you all may have uh, of us. Thank you, Sarah. Yes, well, I'll repeat the question. The question was that some of the recent shootings have, the characterization has been drive-by shootings. And what challenges the police department faces as we deal with that? When you think of a drive-by shooting, you think of individuals in a vehicle that quickly go through a community and shoot at a particular person or structure, and then they move on quickly. By the time the police department is called and respond to the scene, the challenge is being able to get the information that we need of the description of the vehicle, the individuals that were in the, in, in the vehicle as well, and what association that they may have with the victim, if any at all, or whether or not um, this is gang related. So um, many of our uh, drive-by shootings have been gang related, and we have been very open about having that discussion, and that's where we've uh, also been successful in getting information from our community members so that we can identify not just individuals, but groups of individuals that are beefing or com having conflict with each other around the city and it does present a challenge. So descriptions are important. 
the utilization of local video footage um, at, at businesses and other uh, video systems that are, have been very helpful to us and, and to be able to identify what vehicle it was and whether or not that vehicle was actually involved in some other crime in the area as well. Hope I answered that for you, Sarah. Mm -hmm. Yes, Virginia. Virginia, um, with the News and Observer, has asked about two specific 8 Trey Crip and O Block gang groups that have been identified as operators in the city of Durham. The challenge with our various groups are, are that um, when, when arrests are made sometimes, then other individuals actually step in and take the place of those um, uh, actors or leaders in these different groups. We still see individuals that, uh, and still encounter individuals that are involved in these groups. Um, they continuously recruit, they continuously have beefs, and not just those groups, but other groups in the city have bloods, have conflict in our city as well. It's not just relegated in those areas. Some of them may live in those areas, but they actually have encounters in other parts of the city as well. That challenge, uh, you know, last year uh, was one that we faced and tried to identify our key players. We made several arrests. Some of those individuals were um, actually charged federally where we have federal cases. However, those gangs existed, you know, prior to 19 and 18 and 17. And what we want to do, and what the mayor has alluded to as well, is to put systems in place that work for ensuring that our young people have other outlets besides being involved in gang activity and educating our young people. It can't be just the police department. The work is too great for uh, us to be able to handle on our own by just arresting individuals. We can't arrest crime away. Uh, I hope I, I help answer that, Virginia. Yes, sir. So uh, we have strategies from just based on data and what works and what has worked historically for us. Um, if you remember, at one time, it was our McDougal Terrace community that had more shootings than some of our other communities. Um, some of the programs that we've implemented as a department, uh, we believe have uh, some direct imp impact on the reduction of crime in those areas, along with some of the other uh, remedies that the mayor has uh, mentioned with violence interrupters being assigned to that particular community. So it has to be a collaborative effort. Our resources are but, you know, they're limited, to be uh, uh, frank. Our officers respond to calls from one call to the next, and we are more of a reaction to calls for service as it relates to shootings and, and what we want to do is to be more proactive and provide the level of visibility that um, discourages that type of activity throughout our city. Uh, at this particular time, uh, our officers are sort of stretched. They're all over the place. We have COVID-19, we've had protests, so we haven't been able to assign officers in communities where they can just have friendly, soft uh, encounters with our community members to try to use that ta tactic as uh, a deterrent as well. I'm, I'm gonna be honest, people 
are less likely to commit a crime in the presence of a police officer. That's a fact. Yes, sir. I think it's important that you, you understand the operation. We sit and are nestled right here in our community, but our officers are dispatched to calls all through this particular district. So there isn't one officer that's sitting or in this building watching a particular community. Uh, we would love to have uh, uh, more presence and visibility uh, and, and to be able to explain that uh, if, if there were, uh, as I mentioned before, there may be, you know, less opportunities for individuals to, to commit crime. Um, our response is quicker because we are here in, in, this, in this community. However, our officers are constantly dispatched to many other calls. And when opportunity arises, it's when crimes occur. And most of the time, the opportunity is not when the officer is sitting there in the community waiting for it to happen. Hopefully that answered your question. Thank you. Yes. So we constantly evaluate what we have and how we can use the officers that we have and prioritize their work. Our priorities right now are, is violent crime. Unfortunately, sometimes we have other responsibilities that are tossed upon us to um, address, like protests. More protests than what we have been accustomed to. And even though our officers have not been out front and, and in the face of protesters, they are working and on duty monitoring the protests in the event that we have, um, you know, a protest that turns violent. So. Uh, when officers are called from these various responsibilities, it is stress on our resources. It pulls them from the work that they typically would do. So we're constantly evaluating how much longer will we have to um, address the various First Amendment kinds of situations. And we'll be working with our city council on what that looks like. There are studies being done right now on calls for service for the Durham Police Department so that we can evaluate who should best uh, respond to certain types of calls, whether it's mental illness, whether it's homelessness, and take some of those responsibilities off of the police department. I got caught in a, in a situation yesterday where I was on the freeway where seven of my officers were working for more than two hours on one accident. And as I passed by them, caught in the traffic with the rest of the citizens, I spoke to them but that just, that's just a classic example of how our workload is, um, is thrust upon us and we handle those catastrophic kind of situations where something else is going on over here while we have the eight officers out on the freeway. So um, we will be working really closely with our council and the results of the study that's being done on evaluating calls for service and not just looking at the numbers of calls, but what does that one call entail? Does it entail seven officers being out of service for two hours? And that's not an anomaly. That happens quite frequently. Uh, Sarah, and I'll be back with you, Virginia. Thank you, Sarah. I, that's a good question. And Ashley, I think there's, I, I'm sorry. Um, Sarah's question was about the fact that we have a certain amount of operational vacancies. And just to define an operational vacancy, it means that I could have 20 officers that, or 20 recruits 
in training right now, but that's 20 positions where they are not operating. They, they are not operating as police officers because they're in training. So our practice is to try to ensure that we keep uh, our department fully staffed so that we don't have as many operate. We can still operate even with those officers in training. So <clears throat> the rest of the question really had to deal with the climate and recruiting efforts. I think there's a confluence of, of issues with this situation. You have a pandemic, a national pandemic, and you also have a climate of racial uh, equity issues and tension around the country. And just paying attention to uh, the applications that come to our department, we still continue to receive applications. However, uh, recruits have to make decisions about, is this a good time to move my family? Is this a good time to uh, bring my kids from one, one climate or one school uh, to another uh, working environment? And I think decisions are being made about moves in the pandemic and also whether or not this is the um, career field that, that's appropriate from. On the other hand, we have seen uh, individuals who are more energized about being a part of this work as being a part of the solution. So we continue to have uh, recruits in our classes. Uh, our recruiting efforts have been restricted to some degree because we have not been traveling as much and have not been in the faces of individuals and tr have tried to use more digital types of recruiting um, mechanisms as well but uh, we will continue to aggressively um, recruit. But I do believe that the various um, um, environmental kind of you know, issues that we're dealing with has had an impact not just on us, but also on other agencies around the country as well. Thank you. You had a question, Virginia? Yes, Virginia, from the News Observer. Um, has reducing the jail population made any impact on the amount of gun violence in the city? You know, I would need to really look at more data, you know, anecdotally. I know of cases where individuals um, have committed serious crimes and, um, you know, return to the streets and they, they return and commit more serious crimes. And um, that is not um, a, a hypothesis, that is actual reality. And, um, and those are the individuals that we're focusing on. Those are individuals that we are working really closely with our DA, um, who I, I commend for assigning a gang ADA to uh, our unit so that our gang unit can work closer with those individuals, with a particular individual, to help develop cases against our most serious offenders. And that has happened recently. Thank you. Mm -hmm. well, well, I love that the chief's answering. <laughs> <laughs> this is a question for both the chief and the mayor. Um, so we, we're, uh, we've heard about some of the long-term strategies to reduce gun violence, um, but, like some, uh, but when we're thinking about the short-term, what about the people who are getting uh, shot today? We've heard, have we seen like a uh, shot stopper getting turned down by the city council and just like, well, only a limited number of Well, you know, we operate on immediate solutions every day. Um, you know, there's, there's really no playbook for us right now because we've never had a coronavirus. We've never had, you know, some of the obstacles that we're facing right now with these, these upticks that didn't go down, upticks that have stayed up, you know, uh, not just for us, but around the country. And everyone is, is really working daily to try to identify the areas that we need our officers most. How do we increase the time that they work without uh, putting undue stress on them? Because that in itself is another element of the work that we do to make sure that our officers can do this work and do it in a way that you know um, supports officer wellness. So um, we are daily 
changing the game, depending on the work that needs to be done and the community. One day it could be Bentwood, the next day it could be, you know, uh, over off of Roxborough somewhere. So um, the, the work that we're doing in the long-term solution really is to look at, you know, how do we go into 2022 with some additional types of initiatives and plans that address some of the social issues in our community so that there will be some impact uh, on crime from a different angle as opposed to a reactive approach from the police department. I would love to not have to ask for more officers, but as the demand continues, that's, that's, that's all we know sometimes. Thank you all so much for being here today. And uh, I will say that, again, I commend my staff for the work and, and how they've stretched themselves during this particular uneasy time. Uh, it's been very complicated, uh, very complex in the community. We've heard the outcry from our community, not just about gun violence, but about a lot of other sort of nuances that have um, uh, appeared, uh, racing in the streets, you know, people trying to find ways to, to have um, fun in the streets, but sometimes in dangerous ways. And we're trying to address those emerging issues as well. Mayor, did you have anything else you wanted to add? Thank you all so much for being here and stay dry.